Can We Talk About It is the new series of talks. And it's really, I've launched it as a kind of complementary to the Citizens' Assembly that is currently ongoing in Ireland. It's a Citizens' Assembly on all drugs. I know that means dr drug use and stuff like that. And uh, so I'm kind of, my intention has always been to, uh, to get in as many voices and create an online forum with as many voices from the cannabis community, but also we had, we had people from the U UCD, SSDP talking like Manny was talking about how they're studying uh, the effect of how they're studying uh, um, psilocybin in UCD, which is uh, uh, surprising. All of these uh, talks can be found on the YouTube channel, and I will also have on e for a, a background for each talk on the irishcanaclinic.com website, so please check it all out. And please, I, I always forget to do this, please support, uh, like and share, and hit the bell. That's what Russell Brand is always doing, hit the bell there, you know. Anyway, that's the intro out of the way. So tonight, I'm really, uh, if this lady we have tonight is, has been, has, you know, you've really appeared and you've made a, a real position for yourself in the Irish Canada community. It's Natalie O'Regan, everybody, from Park by, and uh, I'm taking liberties there with a, an accent. So Natalie, how are you doing, first of all? Not doing too bad. Unlike yourself now, we're in lovely rainy Ireland as always. Oh, well, you know, well, we're, we're gladly, like I was explaining, we're gladly got rain here. So we'll all have a bit of, uh, you know, some fruit, Spanish fruit and, well, Catalan and wherever it is. But we finally got rain after much drought. Anyway, so uh, in rain from rainy Cork, I would, I would like to know, first of all, how did you get involved in this? That you've now, it's almost like a find you're on every panel, uh, a speaker on most panels now on different conferences around the place. Tell us about that, how you got into the uh, cannabis space. <laughs> Typical Cork woman, you can't get rid of me. Um, but yeah, I I kind of got into it by accident, but it wasn't really an accident when you kind of look back at it. So uh, like my own background is like most 16 year olds, I left school because I knew it all and got a job in bars and restaurants and worked away. And then one random night I said, I'll apply for a law in UCC at the age of 30. Thought it was going to be great crack. It was great, crack, but uh, I have a couple of grey hairs and bags under my eyes after <laughs> doing it. So I went back, done a law degree, um, absolutely loved it so much, having no life and doing everything else. I stayed on, I done my master's. And for right, my master's, I focused on decriminalization of cannabis consumers and how criminalization enhances the stigma and how stigma is probably the one most harmful things of criminalization, especially for cannabis consumers, I think. Um, because we are so quiet and so hidden, everybody knows, but we're still around, yeah. but nobody speaks about it. It's like, you know, everything's shoved under the carpet. Black sheep for the family, shall we say. But um, yeah, since then, I like, went on Twitter for education. And then as most Cork women, I have a big mouth and I like having rent. So I started ranting and pointing out the hypocrisy of cannabis and our drug policy and yeah, just kind of went from there, really. Yeah, and we all appreciate it so much because you're uh, you're now you now do a bit of writing for the Cannabis Review. Is that right? Yep, I do. I usually publish an article every Thursday on the Cannabis Review website. It ranges everything from drug policy to medicinal cannabis to uh, recently is a lot of stuff about Germany, uh, about the Czech Republic, cannabis news, what's going on. And today I just released one on cannabis and the link to psychosis or the, the misconceptions around it and listening to the actual evidence of what the science says. Um, so yeah, a little bit of everything really. That's great. And you're just to finish your introduction, you're to be found on Linktree. I think I, I noticed you have a Linktree uh, Link yeah, the only thing I kind of don't do is Facebook. I think that's dead in the water at this stage. Right, <laughs> yeah, okay. On Twitter, Natalie O'Regan one, I'm on the Cannabis Review, uh, LinkedIn, Linktree, just pop my name in. Yeah. We'll be leaving uh, <laughs> lots, of, uh, lots of information on, a, on your supporting page, let's say. So, uh, yeah, so let's bang, bang, right? You're absolutely uh, overqualified woman, possibly for my, this uh, humble little uh, podcast of talks. And uh, so uh, let's get straight into it because I want to get your, we're in the, this is the second weekend of uh, this uh, Citizens Assembly. 
and uh, long awaited, and I'm delighted it's happening. And it's, it's, I believe it's created good positivity around, I feel a lot of positivity from the cannabis community in Ireland. And just generally, generally people are, they, people are anxious for change and they kind of see that this might be a conduit for it. And uh, so give me your impressions of the, how it's gone so far the first week, the first uh, weekend. This is weekend two. We're in. It's going to. We're on this weekend. But give me the, your impressions of how it's gone so far. Um, I think like most people that have advocated for drug policy change, like we were all highly disappointed in, when the citizens' assembly on drugs did not happen in twenty twenty two as it was promised. So much work went into it by advocates, by patients, people who are just generally interested, by politicians pushing the issue, and. I think everybody's hearts broke a little bit when it didn't happen in 2022. And then finally, it did kick off this year. It's, I mean, our drug policy is almost 50 years old. Um, I think it's well overdue a change. Like, it, it's stuck in the 70s. And Ireland was not a good place in the 70s. But yeah. I think everyone is delighted when it was finally kicking off and we were all waiting to tune in to the assembly. But like most people that have fought for so long, you don't want to get your hopes up. So you're still a little bit sceptical that, you know, it, it's something's going to happen. I don't know, the world will, a meteor will hit Dublin and everyone, there will be no citizens assembly. But you think, you know, you always have, you're afraid to get your hopes up. So when it did kick off, I was delighted. Like there were some fabulous speakers that were there. I think even day one, the, the most standout moment, I think, was the, the panel with um, Dr. Sharon Lambert, Philly McMahon, um, Andy from Ishka and I can't remember the last lady's name for love nor money but it was about lived experience and there was so many good stories from that lived experience panel and what surprised me the most I think was the questions from the audience right they were asking that. questions about human rights they were asking you know clarification questions and what really surprised me is the level of knowledge that the public already have on this issue about like, that? you don't have to educate from day dot they already have a good understanding and I think even on social media and stuff you, you can see that the the public are well ahead of every politician and everybody else that's involved in this conversation the public know change needs to happen you look at every opinion poll you, you hear the questions from the public you, you follow the hashtag on social media people are ready for change and I think they want change yeah you know, and there was a lot of good evidence given. There was a lot of stats, a lot of figures given. Um, but Just in your field, really sorry to inter interrupt. In your field, the human rights, because you mentioned human rights, there was a human rights speaker and uh, from a European perspective. And so uh, what did you what did you make of his speech? I think it, it didn't go far enough. Like, right. I, th I think it, it is a position, it's a valid position, and he's absolutely right in what he was saying. But I do think there is a lot more nuances to this conversation. It's not just plain and simple black and white. And like 15 minutes is not enough for a presentation. Sure. Like the speakers get up, they get 15 minutes, they have to make their points. It's difficult to describe everything in 15 minutes. So like, I don't blame the speakers personally. I don't blame like what they say or anything like that. 15 minutes is not enough to get across a, an issue like human rights. Sure. You what know, do you but I do think, you, sorry? What do you feel yourself about, uh, what, where are the human rights involved in this conversation in, in, uh, in drug use? I think at this stage, it doesn't get enough attention. In right. Ireland, especially. I think there, the, like, there is a lot of talk of um, like supervised injection facility. There's a lot of talk of action. And that's fantastic to see. But there's not much, there's not enough conversation about the rights and everything else that goes on behind this action. Sure. Like the trauma, poverty. I could go on and on and list reasons. They're the issues we need to tackle. We don't need to wait to build a supervised injection facility. Because you need to go backwards, right. like address other issues. And you know, this one will not be as momentous as it is. And by the way, when you talked about action, I mean we have to we have to acknowledge the inaction of those injection centres. I mean, how many how many years ago, an Eidan or Eidan, I, I, I got to tip the fedora to him that he's uh, he's been fighting for that for forever. It feels like 
and they're still not there. I find it curious that this weekend they've scheduled uh, a trip, uh, a kind of a familiarization trip or something. Out, they're bringing the people out to um, to Merchants Key, which was supposed to be the home of a, an injection center, I believe. Yeah, but there is none. No. So, like as far as I know, Merchants Key, they just do needle exchange. There's still no actual supervised injection facility up and running in Ireland. Yeah, and that's maybe five or six years. So, so these are the things that we're kind of uh, sick of. The fact that this has now going on, it's going on that long. So this is what the hope, the great hopes of this citizens assembly that it would, uh, that there would be a few directions that comes out of it that will uh, put a bit of fi uh, fire under uh, these, because these were accepted by the door. The, uh, like we must not forget just this year as well, or in the last couple of months, we also had the uh, Joint Committee on Justice report who brought out some absolutely fantastic recommendations. I think my jaw dropped when I seen this report. I was shocked that such a, such a good, brilliant document with fantastic recommendations are coming from the same politicians and the same government that will stand in the doyle and use the word junkies or stand in the doyle and say that recreational consumers are responsible for gangland crime in Colombia. I mean, it's it's polar opposite worlds. Is it correct to say that the people who produced that and really impressive, I agree, absolutely, they're really impressive a health committee document. They're not the actual politicians. So uh, who, you who, had like Fianna Fáil members, you had um, two Fianna Fáil members, two Fianna Fáil TDs on the panel. Uh, Lynn wow. Rowan was on the panel. Um, there was other like sitting politicians and senators on this panel. So these are the people that are in Leinster House and that are in the Shannon deciding on wow. your laws. And yet they can still bring out this document. But yet again, the opposite is happening in actual action. But with that report and the Citizens' Assembly, I, I do think it's a momentous year alone in Ireland. Building, huh? That's what it feels like. And that's why we all have uh, optimism growing all the time, you know? Uh, did you look for? Did you look towards this weekend? Uh, the, what panels have we got? We've got... Um... I didn't look at the names of the panels. I quickly glanced. Um, but one thing I did note, that they're having their day trips and their day outs, which I think is fabulous because it will bring home the issue. Yeah, I think so. And uh, they're having people like fr it's frontline workers mm -hmm. and uh, also individuals. Another thing that I feel very strong about that I'm really glad to see is that the the kind of this the the expanded kind of family uh, aspect. The people who are in in families that are suffering, who are, I mean, and there's so many dimensions to that. I mean, in the last two weeks, I had it on here on these talks with Deborah Downey, and Deborah Downey had the most amazing testimony about with, with her daughter Abigail and the battle that she had for that, that girl has died since and that uh, and she was 19 and Deborah has been fighting for for that medicine for that would have been 13 years of fighting and uh, to just to get cannabis medicine that she should have had and uh, so that but Deborah was was re very strong on the point that it's not just about the actual uh, patient it's about the whole there's a whole family around every one of these scenarios and we're only talking about patients here but all the 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 people using drugs the addicts and all of them there's families around all of this and you have this uh, very nasty uh, new dimension i don't know is it right to call it new but this dimension where uh, you know people are families are being put into debt by you know one person in the young uh, you know a son or a daughter in the family gets gets uh, tied up in in a bunch of debt that then the, the the gangsters are coming down on top of the family so i'm really glad to see that broadened out and looking forward to that panel so um yeah so anything else you uh we're, we've got to look forward to but one thing I, I haven't heard mentioned much, and I do yet, I hope it will be mentioned more in the future, but I think hopefully there will be some submissions from the public that will mention it as well, is, is non-problematic drug use. Yeah. It's not being talked about enough. Like 90% of drug use is non-problematic. 10% is. What you, are the you can't build a whole drug policy based on 10%. If we'd done that with sugar with alcohol, with caffeine, because I'd be the first to admit I have a severe caffeine problem. <laughs> if somebody discontinued Red Bull, I would no longer survive. <laughs> but like 
we cannot base a whole policy based on 10% of the population. True. Like, I, do, I just think it's baffling. And uh, the EU put us at, what is it, 20, almost 20% or 19% of Irish population are regu re not regularly using drugs, but their cannabis at least is, is 19% of the population is, uh, has used in the last six months. So we have a lot of people. Like there's many reports from 7% to 20%. Like nobody knows the population of Irish cannabis consumers because all these reports are based on people admitting and self-reporting their use sure. how many people are not going to put that on a form and this I would is say the majority of the people probably would not be honest about illegal drug use on an official form or an official survey so sure. those, those self-reporting figures are th there's no idea to know whether it's true or not but like if you look if there is we'd say 20 percent or 17 percent that's about Nearly half a million people, we'd say. Yeah. 20%, half a million people, 500,000. Out of 500,000 people, you have, we'd say probably about six to 10,000 people a year criminalized for personal possession. Shocking. It really is shocking. And uh, um, you were at the cold face of uh, a little bit of the harm reduction involved in... Uh, in festivals, because I talked a lot with the, the SSDP earlier in another chat we had with Manny, and uh, like festivals and the stop and search that's going on in these festivals. And so you were in the front line with your orange jacket on, you have an orange jacket on a lot of the time I see on social media, you're involved. Uh, and uh, so, but you were in the tent in Electric Picnic. Tell us how that, tell us, tell us about that. Uh, it was eye opening. I've never been to a festival i've never slept in a tent in my life so it was an experience <laughs> to say the least um would i do it again absolutely it's fabulous um so yeah i went up last year september 2022 it was the first year ep was back since uh the lockdowns and i volunteered with help not harm who were doing welfare and harm reduction up there so we went up and like after lockdown everybody is I, like you're not nervous in crowds but you know you haven't been in big huge crowds in two three years you walk into yeah. electric picnic and there's twenty thousand people i was like oh my god god um but yeah like Animated. i really opened my eyes up there like it, drug taking at a festival it, it's it's everybody does it yeah. like there is a lot of drug taking and from someone who is like sober up there you know had to babysit and mammy everybody it was eye-opening because there was no badness there was no trouble really there was you know like it, a couple of uneducated people didn't know what they were taking or you know they'd get a, they'd start like freaking out and uh, there was a couple of um drug testing alerts from the HSE up there and like there was people going, oh, yeah, like we've seen the alert for throwing the, the drugs in the bin. You know, so like it does work and you could see it like it was up in the big screen. There's thousands in front of the stage and like you could see people looking around going, is that what we have? Will we check the ones we have? I don't know. But you know, it made people aware. Yeah. And subconsciously it dripped into them. They were all a bit, you know, behaved and there was it was eye-opening it really and truly was is my experience I, I think it's excellent it makes you a hell of a testimony you know the uh for what for what's seen there you know and i know uh, and i'm a glutton for punishment i volunteered with psych care again for this year so shout right. out to psych care ireland they're doing like um welfare and harm reduction services as well at festivals throughout ireland this year so i glutton for punishment signed up again for another round of madness so looking forward to that I will look at it. I think it's so important, and because uh, I have, uh, I don't like, I, so, I don't say, I, can't, I feel like I say it again and again, but uh, uh, like I am a victim of a stop and search at a festival myself 35 years ago. So 35 years ago, nothing has changed. And, uh, uh, and so that was in the, in the original trip to tip and, uh, and that ended in a court case. And I didn't get, I, I got the courthouse poor box donation, which meant I didn't get the, uh, the conviction. 
but I would have been just gone 18. And so the people, uh, and, I, and I noticed after that, after the EP, despite all the, the, the amnesty bin and everything, that there was 200 people went to court. Uh, the father, I don't know, was it Nace and Kildare, whatever, whatever that courthouse was? In Leash, I think it was. In Leash, yeah. And so the people got, uh, and I read that judge kind of didn't take it, you know, he did, you know, it was just kind of, uh, can we, um, they took a lot of money, you know. In almost 50,000 in poor box donations that day. You know and it was all 18, 19, 20 year olds for, you know, their couple of tablets or their, their bit of weed or, you know, whatever personal possession they had on them. Like, Yeah. And I think possibly the tablets and the the, the, the people with cocaine and stuff like that didn't uh, get the poor, the poor box. Uh, I think that was mainly cannabis single or per, personal use stuff that went into that. But uh, yeah, but that's it. I mean, it's it's proper. It's like a decri- it's like a criminalization festival as well as music and uh, it's it's great that you that you get to see it up front and it's it's unfair and i, I do nothing when i admire you for uh, everybody who you know get psych care and the people who get involved in that i mean it's an, it's it, we need this sorry you think it should be that was my question do you think it should be rolled out elsewhere into clubs into oh absolutely i think you should be able to get your drugs tested yeah. I think in city centres on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday night, there should be a van. You can go up, get tested, results back in a couple of minutes. Off you go into your nightclub or into your pub or whatever. That's I, what I'm talking I about. Think it's stupid. I think and you'd be able to get drug testing kits at home. It's it's a no-brainer. Yeah, it should be like a defibrillator almost. Uh, you know, there's there's points. That was uh, Manny, what Manny from the UCD uh, SSDP was saying, you know, we should have them like there it's like a fixture in the town you know where to go to because people do their drugs at home people do their drugs in all sorts of uh, uh, surroundings and it's not it doesn't always have to be out and about and uh, so if people you can i'm going out this friday night i can get my i have i have my pills i have my whatever i have ready to go and so i can get it checked out before before we all drop them because people do it kind of collectively and so if there's a group of five kind of uh, uh, consuming, then it's, you know, you're, you're saving lives with that kind of, uh, those kinds of harm reduction uh, thing, uh, yeah. efforts. I mean, there was pills found up there and I think, I can't remember the figures off the top of my head, but there was two, I think they were XT pills, I'm not too sure, I can't remember. There's two pills found anyway. And the the difference in strength in between the two of them was staggering. Right. Absolutely staggering. Like you take one of one type, you probably wouldn't feel much of anything. You take one of another type and like, oh, it, it was staggering what the levels of what drugs were available and the differences between like, the two. It's like placebo versus death. You know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, that's how important it is. I it's mean, red pill or blue pill, which, which one are you taking? You don't know what's in either of them. Like, And we've had, I mean, there has been deaths in your own county. We've had a we had a tragedy at a was it in Mitchellstown a festival in Mitchellstown uh, that was just from one ecstasy pill yeah and uh, that lady I forget her name but uh, the, the sister is still uh, a very strong advocate but uh, it's there's real tragedies going on here without without this without this this harm reduction it's yep. the importance of it it is it's it's scary out there and even like uh, recently the rise of synthetic can- cannabis and synthetic synthetic contamination contaminated cannabis it it's shocking like it's so dangerous you don't know what you're getting and the synthetic cannabis is it, it's fabulous when it's right it's fabulous when it's done right and it's done legally in a controlled environment it's amazing for many things when it's done by criminals in a shed that's leaking and like it's it's dangerous it is absolutely dangerous we've already had a couple of poisonings from synthetic cannabis from synthetic um or from cannabis jellies um, and right. there's a couple of teenagers um they the couple of them are very very sick very very sick and the poisonings that we are getting are all synthetic can- cannabis because as we know you can't really die from Natural cannabis. 
Do you know, you, can, you wouldn't be able to smoke enough or consume enough to really overdose on cannabis, natural cannabis, but synthetic nobody, cannabis. Nobody, is... nobody, nobody in the Irish state has ever died from cannabis, and that, and nobody can ever take, nobody can ever uh, warp that narrative because it's a fact. And uh, so this CRA, which I find of all, almost find as like I, say, I, I every time I say it, CRA, it feels sinister. And uh, and it and it because I and I've asked I spoke with Ryan on a call here before from Crom and he's a young guy you know and I, I like this the, the this is the value of these talks is that you're able to get uh, the voices of uh, very young people and uh, and Brian is kind of go right why are they so prohibitionist <laughs> and he's baffled you know because he's he's a young guy and he's going you know you know he doesn't understand why people are so against certain things so against the uh, you know sorting out this drug issue sorting out this cannabis issue sorting out these things these prohibitions are so they've got such a thing on their back it's incredible you know, at the same time like the, the only reason they advocate it or say it is because they truly believe it so you know everyone's entitled to their opinion of course Do you have to agree with them Absolutely not. Of course. But and at the same time, they're sitting there thinking, look at these bloody Lulas still waffling on about it. Like, you know, we we all have our, our missions in life, and that just may be. Oh, not certainly. Who's winning is then is there would be the, the next question. Uh, it's like the only people winning will be the people who get safe supply and the people yeah. who will be able to consume cannabis without the harm of criminalization and without the harm of contaminants. That's that's the win. There you go. And uh, I absolutely agree with that because uh, that's what it's all about. I'm here in Barcelona and Barcelona, we have the social clubs. I think, you know, the social club scene quite well. And uh, I mean, that's that to me is the greatest model for cannabis in the world. It, Uruguay sees it the same way. Uruguay, by the way, legalized uh, cannabis before Canada and uh, and they've had it there for 20 years. And they've kind of brought the how they, how they handle the, the cannabis situation in Uruguay is actually they use the, the social clubs because as a way they're able to monitor and they're able to stay on top of what everything that's happening and ensuring that people have safe access via the via the clubs and they're in touch with the people. So it's like if you if you have all your users in a kind of uh, social sub social club setting, share peer to peer, sharing their own knowledge and their own experience and all of that, then they will know and they will help. They help people along, you know, and they help uh, young the young younger people who aren't actually, you know, they're not going to be in the club anyway. If they are, that that's illegal, and so it's a regulated environment, and so. That's and that's just cannabis, but I think it can be for me. It can be broadened out to uh, to more drugs, like they have done in in Portugal. And so between the two, uh, those two models, there, there, I've, I feel that that's where something we can draw on. Well, what do you think? Where is the model that you feel could work for Ireland? I truly believe the social club model would be perfect for Ireland. We're a small island. We have a small okay. population, like in the large grand scheme of things for large companies in America and wherever else, like we're tiny, yeah. we're, like there, there's America. not enough of us here to, to <laughs> come in and take over. It's fine. But like, I do think the social club model would be perfect. And like it would function very similar to we have um, the cooperations from the farmers co-ops co and you know, co-ops have a long, long history in Ireland. So like we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We already have it. We already have the structure that we can adopt. And like it's been done before. It's not so alien. Let's up it again, up a gear, Natalie. What about uh what is con what is considered now an epidemic in Ireland? Cocaine. And uh I mean obviously social clubs for me, it's just a done deal with with the cannabis. That's your cannabis. But with so the the other epidemics as we're now calling the crack cocaine and all of that how do you feel where do you feel that should land well i'm a harm reductionist i i like drug use is going to happen you're not going to stop it you're not going to deter people like fear hasn't worked criminalization hasn't worked drug use has increased people are not afraid of being criminalized for snorting cocaine taking a tablet and cannabis or anything else Yes, it's in the back of their mind. Is it enough to stop them using? Absolutely not. So what is the alternative? 
that we leave the products in the hands of criminals to be contaminated and kill people? Or do we regulate a government supply? You also have the other ethical issues of can the government buy Colombia or cocaine from Colombia that's run by criminal gangs? That's unethical. Can you buy uh, poppies and heroin from Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever? No, that is unethical, obviously. So, you know, my theory is shattered here and there, but, you know, it's a nice idea. I feel that they're just conditions you're talking about. So you set the, you're setting the conditions of the regulation. So whatever, wherever it is. Yeah. That's Wherever. what people need is a safe supply of what they're taking. Yeah, I agree. Now, if it's cannabis, grow your own. Mushrooms grow free in a field. Um, I'm not a horticulturist. I have no idea what else can grow in an Irish climate. Well, they grow they, mushrooms. Mushrooms will grow anywhere. But they grow in a tent, you know, so uh, uh, there's no problem with uh, But exactly, psilocybin, the, because in Australia, we now have psilocybin is, is there, you know, it's been, I don't know, it's, I, don't, I don't know the breakdown of Australia, but uh, I think it's, there's a several states that have now passed uh, uh, psilocybin on pilots and there's pilots all over the place. I think Ireland deserves, uh, oh, my hope, what are you, have you hopes? Give me some of your hopes for citizens' assemblies' uh, recommendations. If the recommendations that come out of the citizens' assembly are similar to what came out of the, from the justice committee, I think a lot of people will be happy. Yeah, including myself. I, you're you're kind of almost guaranteed to decrim at this stage. Um, I just think politicians are too afraid to make the decision on that. What Maybe do you think politicians, about they're they're afraid of getting reelected. Like that's what politicians fear. And like there's people can come out and say no, but off, look, it's there, it's an issue. They don't want to lose their supporters. They don't want to make the, the hard decisions. Hard decisions like abortion, um, marriage equality, like divorce back in its day. A lot went to the public choice because. A lot of them because they needed to legally for a referendum, but a lot of it is because politicians didn't want to make a stand. Yeah. And I, as I said, the public are ahead of politicians in this issue. Politicians are terrified of the public reaction on this issue. There is none. The public are embracing this issue. I think we're uh, too prone to our electoral cycles in Ireland. And many of our many of our politicians are on a fine line, a lot of them. You know, if you look at the last uh, election and uh, there's guys getting in on the 15th count, some of our highest ranking politicians in Ireland are not there. They're not to poll toppers by any means. And uh, so I, I hear what you're saying. There's a lot of people treading, treading carefully for you tread on their dreams. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, like I do think we're going to get decrim. Um, I, I think that's there. That's kind of a done deal at this stage, really. Um, what else we will get out of that? What do I hope for? I hope for social clubs. I hope for the right to grow. I hope for decriminalization. I hope for supervised injection facilities, mobile and stagnant wraparound services, counseling, uh, youth services, education campaigns, drug testing. I could go on. We need so much. We're you're, so you're, out of date. It's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's like a mantra. And uh, uh, so, okay, to wrap it up then, Natalie, uh, uh, taking a lot of your time, and uh, but it's been brilliant. And uh, and I hope you continue in this. Uh, well, I think you are going to be, because you're, you're turning into one a really, really strong voice. And uh, you'll be hopping around these conventions and conferences and all for quite some time. But uh, so just to to wrap it in uh, in how do you see uh, your kind of uh, career in this space are you going to continue like uh, with well like I don't have really a career I still have a normal regular nine to five Monday to Friday day job like right it, it, it's not something that you you get employed in being an act activist and loud mouth now I don't I don't think right. <laughs> but, well, the cannabis is an industry yeah like and and, you know when when it's all up and running here and when we have a cannabis industry absolutely what will I do in that industry I have no idea I've done my FE1s so I've kind of halfway started perhaps trying to be a solicitor but I don't know I'd have to boring training but I don't know I'll, I'll see I have a lot of footwork done and yeah. I'll just see where the road takes me see what happens tomorrow 
Well, look, let's leave it at that. Uh, Natalie, it's been a pleasure. And uh, for everybody else, please subscribe to the channel and hit the hit the button. And yeah, we don't, I'm really bad at this, you know. I, I'm no Russell Brand. He seems <laughs> fluently, blah blah blah. But uh, please uh, subscribe to the channel because and engage with it. You know, leave comments and engage with us. And uh, because this is it's about conversations. And uh, the next in the next few weeks, we've got some amazing speakers on here, and uh, we've had another we've had a great one tonight. So thank you very much, Natalie. We leave it there, and see you later, guys. Thanks.